Thank God. All right, I'm going to get started. I'm going I'm to turn the machine on. Now, again, I'm going to be teaching right off the text. But what I'm going to do tonight, we won't get very far tonight. Let me turn this on. Uh, if you're joining us on way of audio or video, we invite you into the classroom. This is Vintage Bible College. We're teaching today the course of study of the letter to the Hebrews. This is our first night of class, and we're getting a little bit of a late start because we went through all that material. Uh, tonight we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to kind of do the introduction to the introduction is what I call it. Um, we have the first lesson in your workbook, and if you look at it, it, it is the introduction. But I'm going to kind of do a little deeper than that. I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, some other things as well. To kind of give us a, a good start, I'm going to read, though, first uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 1, and um, we'll read a few verses. That'll kind of give us a starting place, and then I'll come back, and, um, and then we'll uh, talk about some of this, and we'll try to work our way into the verse-by-verse -verse study. By, hopefully, by next week, we'll be going verse-by-verse -verse and work our way, Hebrews 1, 2, 3, 4, just like that. But let's read Hebrews chapter 1. Um, the writer of Hebrews says, God who at sundry times, which means different times, in divers or different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, <clears throat> hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Jesus, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power or as many translations say by his powerful word talking of Christ here a couple things we can talk about here and, I, and I'll come back and talk about this later but um, notice verse 3 who being talking of Christ verse 2 verse 3 being in the being the brightness mm -hmm. of his glory Amen. Um, and the express image if you look that up it means the exact character okay. um, it it's not a, he's not a reflection of God. He's, he is the image of God. He is the. That's what the writer of Hebrews is, is pointing out. This is important to them. And the reason it's important is because that's exactly what the Hebrews are struggling with. They're struggling with who is Jesus? That's the question that they're answering, that they're asking. They're, they're, they're struggling about, you, you know, in their faith toward Christ for salvation. Mm -hmm. These are Jews that got saved. And they've now, they're now, because of persecution, are thinking about going back under the law. The writer of Hebrews is determined <coughs> that they're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. He's determined to hold their feet to the fire. He's determined to reinforce Christ unto them, to remind them all over again of who Jesus is. And he's going to do a pretty good job. Uh, right up front here, and just in the first chapter, he's going to keep on reinforcing. He talked about the prophets already. He's compared the prophets to Jesus already. So God spoke in times past to the prophets. Now he's going to speak unto us. He has spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he just grabs them by the juggler, who is the exact imprint. He is the express image of God himself and upholding all things by his powerful word. He was there in the beginning in the creation, and he's the one that's holding up all creation. Mm -hmm. Incredible word. Um, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Those are, I, I'm going to be tempted to teach us out a little bit as we go. Amen. Um, notice a couple things. By himself, he purged our sins. That's not the best way to word that. Here's why. It doesn't mean just like he didn't have any help. It means that he is the soul. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth, I'm the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. That's what he said, John 14, 7. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. That's exactly what the Hebrew writer is saying right here. He didn't, he didn't need any help. He did this all by himself. He alone purged our sins. That's the word when we think about it. Amen. He is our only means Amen. of salvation. That's the whole that's point here. Because he sat down at the right hand of majesty. All these things we'll talk about. Um, at the time that the Hebrew writer writes this, the temple's still standing. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Many of them have left Christ, gone back under the law. They're over there worshiping in the temple. Mm -hmm. And they're going through all the processes. Mm -hmm. He says, notice those priests who are nothing more than types and shadows of Christ mm -hmm. are still going through their motions. Mm -hmm. We know 
We know that on the, on the day of the crucifixion, when Jesus gave up the ghost, the Bible said that the, that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the way into the holies of all was open and exposed. Because Jesus went into the Holy of Holies in heaven on our behalf, so to speak. So the, the ministry of the priests are, are over at that point. Anything beyond the death and resurrection of Christ in the way of priesthood, and particularly here with these Le Levitical priests, is, is nothing more than form and ritual. And it's worthless. has no spiritual value. That's what he's trying to get across to them. They, they've forsaken Christ. They've left the gold and gone back to the brass, so to speak. They've left the reality and gone back to the type and shadow. Amen. Uh, there's so many things I could talk about here, and I didn't intend to, get, to, to quite do it like this, this way, but, but I, I think I should. If you were, if this light were brighter, and I probably should have brought in, brought in a little uh, you know, a slide I have that, that better serves this, you can see the shadow of my hand on the back of this board. Mm -hmm. If the light were really bright and straight ahead, that shadow, my hand would cast a, a perfect shadow on the board. Right. Amen. If you were to look at the shadow of my silhouette, you might recognize it as me. Mm -hmm. Remember, I, I've got a slide here that I use in a lot of my classes, and I just bring in a little silhouette, a shadow of Mickey Mouse. And I put it up on the screen. I say, who is this? Everybody always gets it. I've never had anybody say, I don't know who that is. They always say it's me. <laughs> they just, they've been recognizing him right away. And it's nothing but the shadow of me. Yeah. They, recognize, they recognize the ears. They recognize the tail. They recognize. And then, and then I have another one called you know, the, uh, of Donald Duck. And so I throw Donald Duck up on the PowerPoint, and everybody says, that's Donald Duck. They recognize no facial features on Donald Duck. Amen. It's just the shadow. Amen. Because the shadow is so true to the actual image of Donald Duck mm -hmm. that you can tell it's Donald Duck by the shadow. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what types and shadows are. Amen. All through the Old Testament, your Old Testament is written in types and shadows. We're going to talk a lot about that on Thursday night. We talk about the tabernacle. We're going to do the tabernacle of Israel. We're going to do the priesthood, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, all of that. Every one of those things I just mentioned are all types and shadows of Christ. The priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, is a, is a type and shadow of Christ. Mm -hmm. Think of a type and shadow like a sign or a pointer. If you were to leave here and say you head east toward Greensboro, there's a sign out there uh, used to say Greensboro, 21 miles away. Mm -hmm. um, that sign points you toward Greensboro. Mm -hmm. That's not Greensboro. Mm -hmm. That's the sign of Greensboro. <coughs> right. It's just pointing you in the direction of Greensboro. Mm -hmm. Many years ago when I built my house, uh, we uh, went to the, the, to the contractor and drew up a blueprint for the house. And, you know, we'd, we'd roll it out, and it was nothing but just, you know, draftsman's type drawings. Uh, but I showed it to everybody. Man, look at my house. I'd roll it out on the, I'd say, have you seen my house yet? Yes. And they would say, no. And I said, well, I'd roll it out. And I'd make them, you know, they're bored out of their mind. Look at the little squares and dots. And th that's my house. There's the living room. There's going to be the bedroom. And I started pulling it out. That is, that, that's the, the blueprint of my house. Once the contractor finished the house, I put the blueprint in the closet because now if I wanted to show you my house, I would take you to the house, right. not the blueprint. Right. The blueprint is a sign of the house. Mm -hmm. it's a, it points to the house. Mm -hmm. It's a type and shadow of the house. Mm -hmm. a, a, a trained eye can look at the blueprint and tell you exactly what the house is going to look like. It's, it's what's happening here in this book of Hebrews. He's going to go back and pick up those types and shadows of the Old Covenant, all of which point to Christ. He's going to remind them that all of these types and shadows that you've gone back to worshiping were nothing more than types and shadows. There's no substance to them. There's no reality to them. And so that's one of them is this point that he makes here when he says um, that Jesus, you know, uh, is upholding all things by his powerful word. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Mm -hmm. And those Levitical priests, which were nothing more than types and shadows, yeah. offering four-legged lambs that were nothing more than types and shadows right. of the two-legged lamb, right. in a tabernacle that was nothing more than types and shadows of the temple in heaven, right. were nothing more than types and shadows, mm -hmm. pointers to Point. Jesus. Amen. And they're continuing. These priests offered every day. They offered the same sacrifice for the same sins, the, the Bible tells us. So, 
And yet he says Jesus offered his sacrifice once. Yes. Yeah. This is going to be a common theme all through this Hebrews letter. He's going to keep saying once and for all. Amen. Jesus offered his sacrifice once and for all. So that's what he says here. When he's immediately in this in this opening chapter, he's immediately trying to build their confidence in Christ, trying to refocus their attention away from the types and shadows mm -hmm. over to the reality of Christ. Yeah. Because you can't live at the sign of Greensboro, but you can live in Greensboro. Right. You can't you can't live on the blueprint, yeah. but you can live in the house. Uh -huh. These priests offered a pointer to Christ, and that's why they do it over and over and over because it never was satisfactory. It didn't satisfy our debt. Jesus purged our sins and our sins and sat down yes. forever. That's his whole point here. So he's talking about Christ, building up Christ. He's talking about the superiority of Christ. Verse four being made. Didn't mean to get off on that long of a tangent, but it's a good word. It needs to be said. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels. So now he's taking on the prophets in verse 1. He's taking on the priests in verse 3. In verse 4, he's taking on the angels. Because Israel had a high regard. Judaism had a high regard for angels. So he says, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Mm -hmm. So he's greater than the prophets, he's yeah. greater than the priests, mm -hmm. he's greater than the sacrifices, mm -hmm. he's greater than the angels. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, he goes into a little more detail about the angels. For which of the angels? And part of the reason is that they believe that God delivered the law to Moses by the hand of an angel. Mm -hmm. So they had this high regard for angels. For unto which of the angels said he at any time... Thou art my beloved son. Today have I begotten thee. And he's quoting the psalm there, the Old Testament. And again, and he's quoting lots of scripture here from the Old Testament. Passages they knew. Mm -hmm. Passages they well, they well embraced. They grew up with. Um, he said, For and which an angel did he say at any time, Thou art my beloved son. Today have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, all these are scriptures. Mm -hmm. Old Testament scriptures. And again, uh, when he brings... In the first begotten into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So he says, angels are nothing more than spirits. Jesus is God. Amen. That's his point here. Mm -hmm. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens and the, uh, are the works of thine hands. Mm -hmm. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Mm -hmm. And they shall wax old, as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up like clothing. And thou shalt be charged, changed, but thou art the same, and thy years will shall not fail. In other words, Jesus mm -hmm. is eternal mm -hmm. and moral. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit here on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Mm -hmm. No, that's the answer. That's right. mm -hmm. They're equating Jesus with a little more you know, a, a worth than that of an angel. And he's pointing this out as well as the other I I illustrations he's used. Are, he's talking about the angels again, verse 14. Are they not all ministers? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are the heirs of salvation? That's who the angels are. Mm -hmm. Therefore. See that word, therefore? Mm -hmm. Anytime you see the word, therefore... To look to see what it's there for. It's an easy way to think about that. You don't start a sentence with therefore. Mm -hmm. So when you start a sentence with therefore, and you got to remember when your Bible was written, it wasn't written in chapter and verse as it is now. That was added later. It was just written as one letter. And so he says, therefore, it's a tie into what he's just said. So since he says Christ is greater than the prophets, Christ is greater than the angels, Christ is greater than the priests, Christ is greater than the law, of holding, of holding all things by his powerful word, he's eternally mortal. All of these things he's just said. Mm -hmm. Therefore, here's here's goes right to the heart, the mm -hmm. heart of this context of Hebrews. This is right to the heart. When I when I was in school, they told us that every good story or letter or book um, had to include five things. What were they? The five W's. Who? Who? What? what? Why? 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 When? Why? Why? And then occasionally how is available. That's an easy way to think about it in literature. 
you want to understand who said it, who did he say it to, you know, where was he when he said it, where was the people he was writing to, what, what did he say, why did he say it, when did he say it. That's, right. uh, that's, that's every good story will include those ingredients. That, that really makes up your context. Mm -hmm. Context. Mm -hmm. Context is everything. Yes, it is. Any study of the Bible, any study of any book for that matter, context is everything. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the context, if you don't understand who wrote it, who they write it to, um, why did they write it, you know, who they you know, who they write to, why, did, what was the purpose of the writing, you're probably going to misunderstand that letter. Um, it's a, it's impossible to understand it without the context. That's what we're doing here. That's part of what I'm doing here in this opening chapter, and that's why it's important to understand the context of the of the letter before you actually try to take on this word therefore. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to go into therefore and he's going to say, you ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that you have heard, lest at any time you should let them slip. Mm -hmm. Because that's the problem with the Hebrews. They're slipping. They're slipping. He, it's interesting because um, he, they're, he's using <coughs> sort of a mooring term here. You, you'll figure this out in a moment. He's using mooring terms. He's actually talking about a boat slipping away from the dock and going adrift. He uses that terminology here. Therefore, seeing that Christ is, that God has always spoke to us through the prophets, and now he's chosen to speak through Jesus. He, he's the revelation of the word. That's who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus is the revelation of the word. He is, he, in, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became man and Therefore, you and I have that revelation. Mm -hmm. So he's now speaking to us through the word, through Christ himself. Mm -hmm. He's greater than the prophets. He's the express image of God. He's greater than the tabernacle, the priesthood. Mm -hmm. He's fulfilled the sacrifice. He's the one that satisfied our dead. All these things he says about Christ. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, lest at any time we should slip away from the dock. Mm -hmm. Like a boat that wasn't tied good. Mm -hmm. And the tide gets up. The storm, the wind, the waves begin to move. And that boat will slip away from the dock. Mm -hmm. And a boat in that condition will, will just spin out into oblivion. I mean, yeah. it, it, there's no telling where it'll end up. It'll yeah. just, it'll it'll just drift. drifting away. Yeah. It's drifting away. Mm -hmm. That's what the, it's what's happening to the Hebrews. They're, they're drifting. Mm -hmm. Their faith is slipping away from Christ. Mm -hmm. That's why he says, therefore... Um, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them drift away or slip. Mm -hmm. This is your context. Your context of Hebrews, we're going to talk about in a moment, your context of Hebrews are Jews, for the most part, mm -hmm. who have heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. they've, they've embraced Christ as the fulfillment mm -hmm. of the types and shadows of the old. This is one of the reasons it's extremely important for us to understand types and shadows. And lots of folks don't want to talk about it. Matter of fact, you can offer the tabernacle class, and, and uh, lots of folks say, I don't want to talk about the tabernacle. That's Old Testament stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're free on Thursday night at 6 o'clock, you need to be in the tabernacle class. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I'm serious about that. You, you, you're missing an incredible tree. It's the truth. Because it's in those types and shadows that we're going to see Christ. I'm just trying to recruit my class a little bit while I was in the process. It's funny. But the truth of it is, it's true. And what better, I mean, boy, what better time to do it than take Hebrews and, and then take the tabernacle. And, buddy, you're oh, really yeah. going to get an understanding yeah. of who Christ Amen. is. Yeah. The tabernacle is types and shadows. Pointing us to Christ. The, yeah. the feast of Israel. Those seven feasts of Israel. Most, most people in the church, they don't even know what those feasts mean. They think they're just parties. Those feasts were types and shadows of Christ. It's God's way of, of giving Israel this vivid picture of Christ in the Old Covenant. You gotta remember, they weren't born again. None of the Old Testament people, people were born again. They didn't have the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. That's why when Jesus came, you ever noticed Jesus never, he didn't come out, he didn't outright preach like Paul and others did. Did you, have you noticed it? Mm -hmm. Jesus talked in parables yes, most of the time. Right. He talked in parables because he was talking to unregenerated people. Wow. They didn't have the Spirit of God in them. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Mm -hmm. He guides us in all truth. Yeah. Right. So the Holy Spirit makes those things rhema, revelation to us. Yeah. They didn't have it. And so he'd talk about stuff, and they would go, 
how he's talking about. Right. That's what they'd say to him. What are you talking about? Even the disciples, what are you talking about? Right. They'd see that several times. What are you talking about? Sometimes they were too shameful to do it right. and say it. They were too right. ashamed to say it in, in, in public. So when he get on, they say, Look, yeah. what were you talking about there? Right. Right. I can see him now. Like, yes, yes, he's right. Amen, amen. And then right. afterwards, right. what were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Because their mind, their heart wasn't regenerated yet. So he spoke to them in parables. He gave them examples. This is why we teach children often. We teach them stories and pictures. Because, they're, because that's where they are. And so that's what, that's what these types and shadows do. But they paint an incredible picture of Christ. These Hebrews have had that picture and embraced Christ as the fulfillment of of those types and shadows, that picture, but now time has waned, and they're under persecution by Gentiles because they're Jews. They're under persecution by Orthodox Jews because they're now Christian Jews. And so under great pressure, they've decided it would just be easier to go back to what they used to do and go back to the, tab the tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrifices. Wow. And that's why he warns them really strictly here in verse 2. This is a strict warning. Therefore, we ought to give the things, give the, uh, the, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. Amen. I'll read verse 2, and I'm coming to your question. Sure. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, that's the covenant, that's the old covenant, that's the law. Mm -hmm. if, the, if God did give Moses the law by these angels, and every transgression and disobedience <coughs> received a just recompense of, and reward, we know it did. Right. Yeah. Under the law, the wages of sin is death. He said, if you think the law is going to condemn you, mm -hmm. you wait until you stand before God and you've rejected yeah. Christ yeah. after having yeah. known yeah. him. Right. It's, a serious, it's a serious warning here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How shall we escape mm -hmm. if we neglect so great a salvation? Mm -hmm. an incredible mm -hmm. word. This is the context of this letter. Any other context, we'll miss it altogether. We'll, and we'll be reading through the book of Hebrews and be bored out of our minds. Or we'll make it say something it doesn't say. Mm -hmm. So that's why we want to get the context up front tonight. Right. That's why I'm kind of ad-libbing everything tonight. We'll get to your notes. But it's ad-libbing because I want to make sure we get a, we get a good footing in here right. on yeah. the first night. So that we go forward, we understand exactly what's going on in this book of Hebrews. Because it's going to really make sense. It's going to be a really powerful book. Do you have something? Yes. Uh, with the slipping of the Hebrews, would that be a form of backsliding? It, it, it is a, it is backsliding, but it's deep one. It's apostasy. It's, it's an act of apostasy. Yeah. They're headed that way. Now, I don't, I don't okay. think, and, and since you brought up, let's talk about that for a minute, because this is your context in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. I, I've told you, these are Jews mm -hmm. who have gotten saved. Mm -hmm. They embraced Christ. Somebody came and preached Christ to them. Mm -hmm. they, they said, okay, Christ is the fulfillment of all those types and shadows. So it's backsliding. And so, therefore, they believe him. They grab hold of him. Mm -hmm. They embrace him. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're, they're saved. But now they're slipping. So there's two ways to slip. Yeah. One is backsliding. Mm -hmm. And the other is apostasy. Uh, now this is um, this is where it gets sticky because theologically some folks really struggle with this second term. I don't want you to struggle with the second term. I understand why people struggle because we believe that Jesus seals us. We, we believe we're born again as the Holy Spirit. We're sealed into the day of redemption. No question about it. No question about it. We know that we're in his hand. No man can pluck us out. I fully agree with that. Right. Yeah. I believe that, that you're eternally secure as long as you're in his hand. Amen. Right. But there's a caveat there. Yeah. As long as you're in his hand. Right. The Hebrew, writer, the Hebrew writer is writing to people who have embraced Christ and they've been born again. Somebody says, well, I don't really, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead here because I, with that little chart that I gave you, um, some people say, and we'll see it in a minute, some people say, well, they weren't really born again. Turn over to chapter 3 with me just a minute. I think I will clear this up real quick. I could go through the whole book and show you those kind of things. There's all kind of little nuggets like this. Mm -hmm. but this is the best place early on. Notice what he says in, in, in the word wherefore, you got to know it means exactly the same thing as therefore. Mm -hmm. It's like wherefore, therefore. Therefore, see that holy brethren? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Holy, if you look it up in the Greek, is the Greek word hagios. Uh -huh. Hagios. 
hagios. Brethren is pretty self-explanatory, holy brothers. Mm -hmm. The word hagios is used a lot in the, in the New Testament. Hagios pneuma. Holy Spirit. Amen. The same term used of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. is the same term used of these, of these believers here in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Holy brethren. Mm -hmm. The word holy is an interesting word because the word holy means separate. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. it's, it's synonymous with the word sanctification. Yes, sir. What is, what is you sanctify? It's a short word. Holy is synonymous with sanctified, and it means to separate. Mm -hmm. To separate or distinct. Mm -hmm. God is called, God said, be a holy, for I am a holy. Mm -hmm. Remember when the angels flew around in Isaiah 6? Mm -hmm. When Isaiah saw the, 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 uh, the Lord high lifted yeah, up, right. and, and he saw him in the presence of God, John says he saw the, the uh, pre-incarnate Christ in John 12. John said he was actually seeing Christ before he was actually incarnated in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So we know he's looking at God. And he sees this God high lifted up that begins to describe it. And these seraphim are flying around yeah. in the presence of God. Yeah. These angels yeah. are flying around. What do they say? Holy, 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 holy is Lord. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. The word holy means separate. Yeah. In other words, they're, they're saying there is none like God. There is none like God. He's separate and distinct from all others. He's holy, 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 separate, distinct. There's none like him. So the word holy means to be distinct, to be separate. When he calls these Hebrews holy brethren, it means that they've been, and he says, partakers of the heavenly calling. He's using terminology here that says, they partook of salvation, right. and they're now separated unto God. Mm -hmm. These are believers. Yes. That's my whole point. These yeah. are believers. Mm -hmm. These are people that are now born again. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about unregenerated people here. We're not talking about people that are hanging on the fence. We're not talking about seekers here. So we're talking about people who've embraced Christ, mm -hmm. believed that he was a son of God, right. and now they're doubting it. Now, whether they're doubting it like just from a, from a mental perspective or whether they're doubting it spiritually, the Lord will have to decide. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think they're sort of betwixt and between. Mm -hmm. I don't think most of these believers have apostatized, but I think they're on the road to apostasy. Let's talk about the, two de the difference in the two definitions here real quick. There's a big difference between backsliding and apostasy. This is right there on your study question, so you want to make sure you know this. Um, you'll have to get this part right. Even if you disagree. You don't have to agree. That's why I gave you the opportunity to comment on it. Mm -hmm. So you can hear. But what I need you to say is that there's a difference between backsliding and apostasy. I just want to make sure you understand it from my perspective. And then you can say that I disagree with you. And that's okay as long as you can back it up the scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my whole point, see. Uh, so just make sure you back it up. That's why I said that early. So there's a difference between backsliding and apostasy. Backsliding is when you do something you're not supposed to do. You look at the word backslide just means to sin. Mm -hmm. Backsliding is when you do something you're not supposed to do or you don't do something you're supposed to do. Sins of commission is doing things you're not supposed to do. Sins of omission is not doing things that God has asked us to do. Either way, it's a sin. Either way. So when you think about backsliding, backsliding is sin or it's disobedience. That's backsliding. Everybody in this room is probably backslidden at some point, in some way. Not, not entirely, maybe. Right. But you've done something God told you not to do or didn't do something he told you to do. Right. That's sin. And God has a way. You can turn over just a few pages there. In Hebrews chapter 12, he tells us how God deals with backsliders. In chapter 12, verse 6, um, he says, Whom the Lord loves. Chasing. Chasing, if you look it up, means spank. Verse 12 and 6 means to whip, to, to, to spank. Nobody spanks their children today except God. You know, everybody's got away from that, and that's why we said it's gone crazy. But um, God still spanks his children. Still spanks. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. 
which means discipline, actually. Mm -hmm. This is the word that means faint. Scourges. He scourges every son whom he receives. Mm -hmm. A couple of key words there. Whom the Lord loves, uh -huh. he disciplines. Mm -hmm. Whom he receives, he chastens. Mm -hmm. So this is how God deals with backslide. If you do something he's told you not to do, he, he chastens you. <laughs> whether it be some type of chastening or whether it be, you know, where God is actually, you know, uh, spanking us, mm -hmm. scourging us, mm -hmm. means to whip. Mm -hmm. That's how God deals with the backslide. Mm -hmm. He'll chasten us until we turn around. You, your children do it. We, we all done it when, when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, you tell my mother, you, she'd say to me, you can play out in the front yard, but don't go into the road. Yeah. <laughs> Man. All I can think about now is going into the road. <laughs> I mean, it's just driving me crazy. You, should, you know, have you ever said something, don't, don't look up? You know, somebody was talking, said something the other day, they said, they said uh, now, now, now don't, don't look to the right. But, man, it's the it's hard to look to the right. Why did you tell me not to look to the right? You know, I, I, can't, I can't stand it now. It's the way we are. And so you tell a child, my mother would say, you can play in the front yard, but you can't go on the road. And you know what? I would do good for a little while, but just as soon as I knew she was gone, I told <laughs> Just, just, it's just human nature. Yes. Yes. I'm saying it's right. right. And sometimes I got scourged for it. Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't mind. She didn't spare the rod. <laughs> it didn't bother her a bit. <laughs> it hurt me more than her hurt. Amen. <laughs> but that whole idea of is, is God does God this with his children. So when one of his children are disobedient, then God chastens them back to repentance. Mm -hmm. You can do that to a backslider because a backslider just got caught up in some disobedient act, some mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. The Hebrews obviously are backslidden to some degree here. But apostasy is an entirely different um, word. If you look up backsliding and talk about disobedience, if you look up in the dictionary, apostasy, uh, I'm going to give you what I think is the almost verbatim American Heritage Dictionary definition, a total abandonment mm -hmm. of one's Faith. Now we know by the context we've already read so far that the Hebrews, their faith in Christ, mm -hmm. because that's the context. Remember, context is everything. Everything. So when we talk about apostasy here, it's a total abandonment of one's faith in Christ. It is possible to sin or to, or to disobey God in some way without denying that God is, that Jesus is God. Right, right. It's, it's, you know, lots of folks backslide. They do something they shouldn't do. And I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying <laughs> they do something they shouldn't do or they don't do something they should do out of disobedience. But they're not, in no way are they denying that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for their sins. And in no way are they severing themselves from him. They, they have no intention of running away from Christ. They just want to do what they want to do. Right. 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 That's not where the Hebrews are. They're, they're not just backslidden. They're apostatized. Mm -hmm. Or they're on the road to apostasy. Mm -hmm. They're denying their faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the way they're denying their faith in Christ is that they're transferring their faith in Christ to something else. Mm -hmm. And in their case, the law, the priesthood, the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. If you leave, if you take your faith in Christ and you stop trusting Him alone, mm -hmm. we know that Ephesians 2 8 9 says, We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. You could add the word alone, not of works, lest any should boast. That's why He says over here in verse um, 3, we just read a moment ago, that Jesus had by Himself purged our sins. Mm -hmm. There is no other way. The, the law, the priesthood, the sacrament, the tabernacle, the sacrifices. He says in chapter 10 that God gets no pleasure, took no pleasure in the animal sacrifices. So therefore, you could offer all the sacrifices you want and it would never suffice. Mm -hmm. The reason God allowed the sacrifices before Christ came under the old covenant was because they were types and shadows and they were doing those things in, in, in hopes of them and looking ahead to the Messiah who would come. Mm -hmm. Now that he's come... To go back to the types and shadows would be to deny that Jesus Amen. is the fulfillment of those types and shadows. Right. Right. And to deny that he's the fulfillment of those types and shadows means that you have no means of salvation now. Right. 
That's your apostasy. Yeah. That's your apostasy. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Mm -hmm. I am the way Jesus said. I'm the life. I'm the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if you lose your faith in Christ, and that's what the Hebrews are in danger of doing, mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of sinning, because all of us have sinned. We're not in any way minimizing that. Right. Or, uh, or, you know, making light of it. We're just saying that we've all sinned, but we had no intention of denying who Jesus was. I've sinned, but, I, but if you'd asked me while I was sinning, do you believe Jesus' Son of God? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Do you believe you died on the cross for your sins? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you believe that you're saved because of him? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Big difference there. But these Hebrews are saying, well, we think we can get to heaven by some other means. No, you can't. We can lead Christ, go back, start keeping the law. And we know the Galatian writer says the same thing to the Galatians. He says that if you are circumcised, and what he means is if you're trusting circumcision for your salvation instead of Christ and his finished work, then you are fallen from grace. What he means by that is you've abandoned grace and gone back under the law. And there's no way to be saved under the law because... All the law does is condemn. He tells us yeah, that right. in, uh, in yeah. Galatians chapter 3. And so, therefore, the best the law can do is point out your failures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for these Hebrews to leave Christ and to go back under the law, let's just get really, really raw and pure with it here. For the Hebrews to leave Christ and to go back under the law, start keeping the law, you know who they're really trusting? Themselves. Themselves. Mm -hmm. They're trusting their own righteousness. Mm -hmm. right. Don't worry. And all of our righteousnesses are still yes. yes. So we, the best you can do is come up short. So this is why an understanding, the context here is so important, mm -hmm. to understand that there's a difference between backsliding and apostasy. These right. Hebrews are in danger of apostatizing. Now, whether they have or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some probably have, but I don't think most have. I think that's why he's trying to salvage them. I think that's why he's writing them a letter to them. Right. He's encouraging them, look, don't turn away from Christ because that's a dead end street. There's nowhere else to go. Right. Right. Know, that's our righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's why he says, like in chapter 3, we go back over there to that verse we read, um, you know, whereas, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's constantly, and we'll see it all through the letter, constantly pointing them back to Christ. Now, I've jotted down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I don't have time to really read them here much, but there are multiple passages regarding apostasy in this letter. They're all going to approach it to some degree of a different angle, but they're all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we at any time should let them slip, mm -hmm. drift away. And that's why he warns them. For if the word or the law was spoken by the angels... Was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience <clears throat> received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, mm -hmm. which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, and God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and yes. divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his will. In other words, he says, look at all of this evidence that you have that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. You're going to walk away from what you wow. know to be true yeah. and now deny it? Oh Go back God. under the law? Mm -hmm. He says that's an act of apostasy. That's walking away from your faith in Christ. How could you be saved? Mm -hmm. How could you be saved? Mm -hmm. Chapter 3, already done read verses 1 and 2. How about chapter 4? Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of us, left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. See that word? Mm -hmm. Any of you should come up short. Come up short of what? Entering into his rest. What's his rest? Look it up. Chapter 4. Look it up. Mm -hmm. The rest there is the rest that we have from our labors Amen. because Christ has paid our debt on the cross. Right. Yeah. Yeah. From our yeah. justification in him. Amen. Yeah. And it, you know, not only do the Hebrews do this, we have to be careful. We do this all the time in the church. Yes. You know, here's, I'll, be, I'll probably use this a lot in the class, um, but there's a little equation you probably want to get, get familiar with. Christ plus what equals salvation? Nothing. I've heard me talk about it before. That's Christ nice. plus nothing equals salvation. Amen. That's true. Some people have Christ plus nothing Christ plus. Christ plus baptism. Yeah. Huh. Work, they gotta go, they gotta go through some work. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Works. They, got, they believe they have to Jump through some hoop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything you add to that blank there mm -hmm. is 
is headed down the road to apostasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now you're trusting something or someone yes. other than Christ for your salvation. Yes. When Jesus died on the cross, he said it is almost finished. They'll just help me out here a little bit. Think about it. He didn't say it'll be finished once they, you know, uh, give that offering or once they, you know, do this or once they add that or once they jump through this hoop. He didn't say that. It's finished. That's why he says he sat down. His work is finished. That's what we call the finished work. And he's going to say that over and over in the letter. He sat down. He sat down. He did his work once and for all. It's the reason that, that Moses got in trouble for smiting the, side, the, the, the rod, the rock the second time. Because Christ is only spitting one time. To smite him the second time means that his first work wasn't enough. It's what's, it's what's happening, people who are trying to add to salvation. And so over and over, he says, and that's why he says, let us fear less being able to enter into this rest. That rest is Christ. If you look it up. Chapter 6, we'll talk about this next week. Very important chapter. Um, verses uh, 4 through 6, you're probably the most prominent of all the teachings in Hebrews, uh, the, the most, probably the most discussed and controversial passage there, is um, once you've been enlightened, taste of the heavenly gift, make tricks of the world to come. Um, if you fall away, it's impossible to do your repentance. Boy, he's talking about apostasy there, and that's yeah. what they've done. We'll talk about it. Chapter 10, another one, where he talks about, you know, we get in there over there in um, chapter 10, we talk about, you know, not forsaking the sin of ourselves together. Look what he says in verse... Um, Chapter 10, verse um, 28. He, he that despises Moses' law died without mercy. How much sore punishment shall he be who thought worthy, who hath, uh, who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing? Mm. Um, there you have it again. Again in verses uh, 35 through 39. Chapter 11 through chapter 12 is all about trusting Christ alone for salvation. That's what the letter's going to be about. I can't believe the time has come and gone. It's incredible. I'm just getting, I'm just getting started. Amen. Come up here next week. It's going to be a good study, though. Which I told you today would be the introduction. The introduction. We'll come back. We'll, I'll be in your notes next week. Lots of ground we'll cover here. I didn't, I didn't get to your slide tonight. But I had good discussion. Um, for those of you who join us, we have audio or video. This includes the class. Join us next time. Lots we can say. It's totally out of time. Got folks waiting for the next class. So I'll have to go. But uh, hopefully.